and welcome to the National Air and Space Museum. We're so glad that you're here with us today. This is What's New in Aerospace, and we're thankful to everyone for joining us, either here in person or online, through Air and Space Live, NASA TV, and Facebook Live. My name is Shauna Edson. I'm an educator here at the museum. And today we are celebrating the Ingenuity Festival, celebrating innovations in American culture for the past 150 years. And for today's program, we are incredibly honored to have as our special guest, Dr. Natalie Vitalia. Uh, Natalie is an astrophysicist at the NASA Ames Research Center, and she's currently the project scientist for the Kepler mission. This year, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. We are so pleased to have you here, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Um, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be able to ask Natalie questions during this program. You can either enter them online or you can step up to the microphone if you're here in person. So Natalie, what are exoplanets and how do scientists look for them? Exoplanets are just planets like we have in our own solar system, uh, except we've attached this prefix exo, which means outside. And the reason we use that is to emphasize that these are planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy, not not our own sun. So we're searching for planets orbiting other stars like our sun, maybe even one that's a little like home. Yeah, so, so there are different ways of finding them, but I think what's important to understand is that um, we don't necessarily, for, for most of the discoveries that have been made, we're not taking telescopes and slewing them around the sky and saying, aha, there's one or there's one. Most of the planet discoveries are done through indirect techniques that is, we observe some property of the star that allows us to infer the existence of the planet. And there are a few methods um, that astronomers are currently using. Perhaps one that's most well known is the Doppler method. The Doppler method is searching for the wobble of the parent star due to a gravitational tugging of the planet itself. You know, planets orbit their stars, but stars actually orbit their planets too. They're orbiting about their common center of mass, if you could imagine holding a fulcrum point and balancing them. So this, the star itself is wobbling just a little bit. Um, so we collect the starlight, we spread it out into a rainbow, and we look at features of these colors that, would, that are Doppler shifted. And that indicates the motion of the star and tells us what the mass is of the planet that's tugging on it. So that's one methodology, but you know, once we started finding planets using the Doppler method, we really wanted to find an Earth-Sun analog. And unfortunately, with today's technology, we're not able to find this really tiny wobble due up to a planet so small like Earth that is so far away, at like a one-year orbit, like our own Earth. So we had to look for other techniques. And uh, there was a technique that was proposed in the 1980s called the transit method. And the idea is really simple. Basically, if we could imagine this light as a, as a star, right, a lot of starlight, um, and here we're going to imagine this is a planet. Uh, planets orbit their stars in planes, like a pancake. And if you look at a random sample of stars in the galaxy, some of those planetary systems will be aligned so that the planet will pass directly between the disk of the star and your telescope. So basically every rock that's orbiting a luminous star is casting a shadow out into the galaxy. And in these unique geometries, that shadow is going to sweep across the face of the telescope, and your telescope will measure that as a momentary dimming of light. So we call it the transit method because the planet is transiting, literally transiting across the face of the star. And the idea was that with this technique, we would, be, we would have the sensitivity of being able to measure a planet as tiny as an Earth. You know, in this scenario, the star, or a star like our sun, would be a hundred times bigger than this ball, if you can imagine the size of that. And it would block out only one part per 10,000 of brightness. Right? So it's like looking at a skyscraper at night and having one person go to the window and lower the blinds by about two centimeters. That's the amount of brightness that, that we're trying to detect. So, so how, do you, how does that look? If it's such a tiny change, how does that look? How do you see it? Well, we're, we're, we have a space telescope that measures brightness. Um, and so we just have a graph, really. I mean, just right. a bunch of numbers come out of a computer. And we measure brightness as a function of time. Mm -hmm. 
and you see the brightness track along. There might be a little bit of noise as is represented in the graphic here with the green trace. And then when you have a transit, when the planet crosses in front, you see that small dimming of light. And it lasts for a few hours, but it repeats once every orbit. Of course. So it's because of the repetition and the regularity that we can tease these kinds of signals out from other kinds of signals that might mimic a planet. Ah, oh, that's, it, it's so, it, that, the transit method, I, I, you might even call it ingenious, that, that we can find these planets based on a change in the star brightness, even though we can't see them directly. I that's love right. that. Mm -hmm. So now that we understand the transit method a little bit, can you talk a bit about the Kepler mission mm -hmm and your work with the mission. Yeah, well, Kepler is a NASA mission. It's through the Discovery Program. It was proposed five times. Failed four times. It was only selected on the fifth. Um, each time for good reasons. We had to go back to the drawing board and, and make solutions to problems and show feasibility, demonstrate feasibility. Um, so it was selected in 2000, 2001, thereabouts. Uh, for flight and it launched in 2009. It's basically a space telescope is depicted here. It has a one meter telescope or mirror that collects light, collects all of that light, focuses it directly onto a set of detectors that measure brightness. And they're basically exactly what you have in your cell phone camera. It's just a CCD chip. Photons fall on the CCD chip that is converted into a voltage and the voltage is converted into a number that's related to the number of photons that landed on the detector. Except this, the detector in your cell phone is about the size of your thumbnail. These detectors are mosaic together to be about one square foot. So it's a, it's a large detector, but it measures brightness very, very precisely, like a part per million precision um, in order to see these tiny changes. So we stared at one patch of sky, uh, kind of close to the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, but actually in the constellation of Cygnus, the swan, which is a summer constellation in the northern hemisphere. And the patch of sky, which you see here on the graphic, this little mosaic of squares, those are the stars on the sky that we, that we uh, monitored, and they're tucked underneath the wing of Cygnus the Swan there. And we stared at that field for four years, taking the brightness measurements of about 200,000 stars simultaneously, once every 30 minutes, without blinking for the entire four, four years. Uh, you know, because these brightness measurements, they only last a few hours. And you have to wait maybe a whole year for it to come back. So you don't want to blink and miss it, right? So, so that's basically the idea. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we have a question from uh, Facebook Live. What is the resolution of current exoplanet images? Mm, that's a great question. So um, as I explained, most of the planets are discovered by indirect means. But there is a small handful, maybe I could count them on one hand, um, of planets that have been discovered through what's called star suppression technology where you, you block the bright light, which is the star, so you can see the very faint planet that's reflecting light back at you next to it. Um, and then even in those cases, while it's true that you're seeing the light that's bouncing directly off of the surface and you see that tiny little dot, that dot is not resolved. So you're not actually resolving the disk of the planet and seeing any kinds of surface features. It's an unresolved blur of light. But it's special because if you can actually catch the light that's reflecting off the surface of a planet, and if you can spread that out into a rainbow, you get all of the different chemical fingerprints due to the way that light reflects off the surface of the planet. You know, light reflects off of ocean differently than it reflects off of forest or desert. Um, and as the light passes through the atmosphere, the atmosphere imprints this chemical fingerprint. So, so these are very special discoveries in that they allow us to get the physical properties of the surface, of the atmosphere, and even the chemical constituents that the atmosphere is made out of. And again, we, we can figure that all out, even though we can't resolve the planet. Yes. We can still gain all that information. It's just magical to me. <laughs> um, so for the Kepler spacecraft that you work on, it was staring at that patch of sky for, as you said, four years. Um, but at one point there was a problem with getting it to keep looking at that part of the sky yeah. and your team had to come up with a pretty clever solution uh, to sort of push us into the K2 mission. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this telescope is out in space and you might think, okay, out in space, nothing's pushing on the telescope. You could point it in one direction and it would keep pointing there stably 
for, for all of the duration of the mission. Um, that's not quite true because sunshine is shining on the spacecraft. And it turns out that sunshine actually exerts a little bit of pressure on the spacecraft. It's called radiation pressure. So in order to stabilize the pointing of the spacecraft, just to keep it pointing in one direction, you need gyroscopes. And so there are, you need three gyroscopes to control the three different axes of rotation of a spacecraft. And we actually had four on board the spacecraft. We had one for redundancy. But early on in the mission, one of them ground up and, and stopped. It halted. It stopped spinning. So we lost one. And then almost to the day, we completed four years of spacecraft operations, almost to the day. In fact, on my birthday, oh. <laughs> we lost another one. No. So we had these two gyroscopes that were controlling two axes, but one was open loop. And so now that the radiation pressure is being exerted on the spacecraft, it could start to spin about that axis. And so that prohibited us really from doing any science at all. But the Ball engineers, the engineers at Ball Aerospace, came up with a very clever solution. They said, well, the spacecraft is actually, it, it has an axis of symmetry, just like a rowboat. Imagine a rowboat, you know, you've got this, the helm of the boat and it comes down and it's, it's also symmetric about that, about that uh, one axis line, yeah. through the center line, right? And the spacecraft also has an axis of symmetry. So if you could take a rowboat and point it directly upstream so that the water is flowing perfectly symmetrically, then you could balance this, the, the rowboat against slewing from side to side. And so we did the same thing with the Kepler spacecraft. We made use of the fact that there's one axis of symmetry, and we pointed that axis of symmetry directly towards the current of light that's flowing towards the spacecraft from the sun. And so that third axis was then perfectly balanced, and we used the gyroscopes to balance the other two. That meant that we couldn't point at Cygnus the Swan because that required that we moved, it required we moved the spacecraft along what's called the ecliptic, which is basically the orbital plane that all the planets orbit, you know, that pancake of the solar system. Um, so it meant that we had to observe different fields of view, but that's actually turned out to be quite fortuitous because it means that we've opened up new science opportunities. Now we got to observe things like asteroids and, you know, open clusters, these star forming clusters that are, you know, in the, in the galaxy and not necessarily in the location of the center plane of the galaxy um, or the Milky Way. Um, so, so it just opened up a lot of really new science, um, which was exciting. It was so great to take something that seemed like it had gone wrong and to find a way to turn it into new science that you might not have expected. Turn it into an opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that was I, we. We were all very excited when we heard that Kepler was not dead. That we were still that we were still getting and science it's out of it. Still up there taking data. It and, is, and it should be able to take data for about another year. Oh, great! Hey, we will keep following that. All right. So, so Kepler is still running, and it was one of the first missions that was dedicated to searching for exoplanets. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some exciting new future missions, uh, such as the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite TESS mm -hmm. and the James Webb Space Telescope. And both of those are expected to really revolutionize how we're able to see the sky. So can you tell us a little bit about how those future missions might uh, change the science, what, what we might be able to find yeah, using those. Absolutely. And, and maybe I should also back up. You, you had asked, uh, you know, what, what are the main science results from Kepler itself? Like, what did we learn from Kepler? Yes. Um, and that kind of factors into the story because mm. it affects our long term planning. You know, Kepler was selected to really answer one fundamental question, which is what is the fraction of stars in the galaxy that harbor potentially habitable planets? We needed this number. We needed to know if planets like Earth were common or rare. We needed to know how far we would have to look out before seeing large numbers of them that we could study. And right. so that's a number that Kepler provided for us. We learned that the galaxy is home to over 10 billion potentially habitable planets. Um, we learned that on average, every star that you see in the sky on average has at least one planet actually more like two. Um, so Kepler in that sense was a statistical mission. We stared at this one patch of sky in the direction of Cygnus the Swan in order to do a demographic study of exoplanet populations. 
Um, the next step, as you mentioned, is the TESS spacecraft, which is going to do what Kepler did. It's going to look for planets using the transit methodology, right? Um, but it has four cameras in its, in its barrel, each angled so that they're staring at a slightly different part of the sky. And in fact, they form a, a longitude strip that goes from the pole down to the equator. So they can stare at one longitude strip and they will do so for about 30 days and then they're going to clock over and do the next longitude strip and so on and so forth, clocking around the entire southern hemisphere sky. And then they're going to do that for a year. And then the next year they're going to flip and they're going to survey the entire northern hemisphere. So, so in this way, they're going to do a complete survey of all of the nearby star systems to try and find the nearest planetary systems that are in this just right geometry of, of transit. Um, that's important yes. because in 2019, we're going to launch the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And what the James Webb Space Telescope will do is observe these transiting planets mm -hmm when they're in the transit position. In this very special position, when you have a star and a planet in front, some of the starlight is going to filter right through that thin atmosphere that hugs the planet. And so that atmosphere, again, will impart its chemical fingerprint on the light. The, the Webb telescope catches that light, again, spreads it out into a rainbow, and analyzes these chemical fingerprints in order to understand uh, the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere, what the atmosphere is made of. Um, so we're entering really a new decade of exoplanet exploration, which is the characterization of their atmospheres. And that's what TESS and Webb is kind of a dynamic duo <laughs> will do together. Oh, that's so great. Um, so, if TESS is only looking at a patch of sky for 30 days, it will, it will, will it only be able to find planets that are close enough that their orbit is that short? Or yeah. is there a way to find some of those longer that, That's a good planets? point. You know, Johannes Kepler in the 1600s taught us that there's a direct relationship between the, the orbital period, how long it takes a planet to go around once, mm -hmm. and the distance between the star and the planet, mm. right? So, yes. there, so by measuring the orbital period, we get the separation. So the closer a planet is, the shorter its orbital period. And TESS, as you mentioned, will be staring at systems for about 30 days. So, so yeah, it will be sensitive to planets in shorter orbital periods. However, it was designed so at the pole, there is an overlap region. So at the poles, we will have observations of this overlap region for an entire year. Then it'll swap and it'll do the next hemisphere, but we hope that the spacecraft will continue to operate after its baseline mission is over, and then we can go back and repeat the experiment all over again and get that long-term continuous coverage and start to find some of the more, uh, some of the planets in these wider, wider orbits. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh. Uh, we have another question from Facebook Live. Um, is there a set schedule for what Kepler looks at? Right now with the K2 mission, yes, uh, it changes every 80 days or so and it looks at a different field of view and it's done several different experiments. Um, it looked at various star forming regions like Taurus and Pleiades. Um, it looked at the, uh, the Scorpius star forming region in the southern yes. hemisphere. Um, coming up in this next campaign, it's going to do a supernova survey. Um, so it's, it, it also did an experiment actually looking right at the center of the galaxy where the density of stars is really high. Um, so each experiment is slightly different and targets different kinds of objects, um, but they are all well planned out throughout the lifetime of the mission. Excellent, thank you. All right, so, so going back in time a little bit in your life, um, when you were in college, you got an internship at the Wyoming Infrared Observatory, and um, your advisor had given you a fairly challenging problem, and you came up with a pretty creative solution. So on, on this day when we're celebrating ingenuity, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you yeah. solved that? I, I, it was my first exposure to science. Up until that point, I didn't understand what science was, honestly. And I didn't plan on being a scientist, frankly. Mm. I, the first thing I said to my advisor when I met him in that introductory meeting, I said, listen, I'm not like the other kids here. I, I'm not planning on getting a PhD. 
I'm not going to write a book one day and be a f physics professor, you know, I'm just here because I guess at that moment in time I thought I was going to bridge business and high tech. So I was, I was starting out as a business major um, and he just laughed at me and he, and he gave me this problem and, and it was interesting, it was challenging, it was fun to do. Uh, we were looking at these rainbows, you know, from stars, kind of, they were baby suns. Uh, one star in particular called HL Tau. It's one of the stars in the Taurus star forming region. And there was some indication that this star had infalling material. It was still forming. Okay. Um, and he was convinced that we should, because these were infrared spectra, we should be able to see features from molecular carbon. So C2. Okay. Um, but nobody could see them. And it turns out that the reason that they couldn't see them was because of the way that they were analyzing the data. And so I dug back down to the pixel, original pixels that came off the spacecraft and figure out a way, figured out a way to analyze the data that teased out these very weak signals of C2 that ended up to be smoking gun evidence of infalling accretion onto the star from the circumstellar material. Um, but, but the main takeaway from that is that once you see something, that nobody else in the world has ever seen before. You're looking at something new, and you have that thrill of actually solving a, a challenging problem. It's addicting. I mean, it's it's so fun. I, I think kids these days don't understand what it means to do science. I mean, it's really that that kid-like exploration that we all you know knew when we were kids and seemed to have lost over the years. Um, and I felt like I recovered that, and, and it, was, it was really wonderful. And so, of course, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's so wonderful, because that is, that's why we do this, is, yes. is the, the thrill of that. The thrill of discovery. Oh, that's that's so right. wonderful. Pushing boundaries, pushing the frontiers, and I think learning um, about our place in the universe is, it gives us, gives meaning to our lives. Yes. Um, for me, that's been very, a very important part of why I do science. I think I was a kid who was always looking to understand why we're here, what we're doing here, and what's the purpose of our existence. And of course, I don't have all those answers, but learning about the universe has showed me, it has given me a very deep reverence for mystery. You know, to just kind of sit back and say, yes, it's mysterious and it's really beautiful. And I'm just so grateful that I'm this little part of the universe that's become self-aware and I'm just going to recognize how precious that is and enjoy it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the beauty of science is we will never have it all figured out. There will always be things to be curious about. Yeah, but maybe there's no limit to what we can know at exactly. the same time. Exactly. That's exciting in and of itself. Absolutely. We have a question from our on-site audience. Hello. Um, my name's Eddie Bono, and I'm with the Foundation of World Peace. I was a little history on you. If you were interested in this as a young girl growing up in grammar school and uh, to become a doctor and a scientist and an in engineer, um, and if you worked yeah. along with children uh, like nowadays to right. inspire them to have the inspiration that you have. Yeah, so you're asking if I was interested in this as a young child. Right. Um, and the answer is surprisingly no. I, I really wasn't. Um, I didn't, and it's because I didn't know what science was. Even all the way up through high school and, and the beginning of college, you know, I, I think it was not that I thought that it was something I couldn't do because I was always really good at mathematics. I excelled. I was always top of the class in math. Um, it's just that I didn't see that it fit my understanding of who I am and what my strengths were. I wanted to do something that helped people. I wanted to talk to people. I pictured a scientist, honestly, as a person who wore a white lab coat and sat in a room all by himself pouring chemicals into beakers. And that just didn't fit with my understanding of who I thought I was and what my strengths were. It wasn't until I learned what science is and that it does involve all of those factors, me talking to people, working on a team, solving complex problems together, relying on one another, and the different ingenuity that every single person brings to the table, that I realize that all of those skill sets do come together in that endeavor. Um, so I didn't come to that realization until much later in life. And I find that that's common amongst a lot of females in particular. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question from our audience. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, Quick two-part question. I'm sure launch day for these satellites is very nervous and anxiety-ridden and exciting. 
Where do you watch the, the launch? Uh, and, and secondly, uh, both for Kepler and, and where you anticipate Tess and, and James Webb. And then also, do you envision a day where mankind will actually visit some of these exoplanets that you've discovered? That's a great question. I, I get that question a lot because, of course, that's what we all dream of. Um, the first question, I've only had the opportunity to attend one launch, and that was the Kepler launch. Um, as part of the team, I did get to go out to Cape Canaveral and, and see it. And, and you asked if I was nervous. Uh, surprisingly, no, it's probably because of my naivete. You know, you just kind of leave it all in the hands in the, of the engineers and assume it's all going to go off flawlessly because, of course, it always does. Well, it doesn't always. In fact, the week before Kepler launched, the OCO spacecraft, it was a carbon observing satellite, was launched from Vandenberg and the, the fairing of the rocket didn't open and it went right into the Atlantic. And so, yeah, that was nerve wracking. Um, but what they did was they looked at the parts list for, the, uh, for that spacecraft, you know, thousands and thousands of parts, I mean, down to every nut, bolt and screw. They looked at them and they looked at the parts list for Kepler to see if there were any parts in common. Um, and so it slipped the launch by a couple of days, but um, in the end they found that there were no parts in common and there was little risk of it happening again. But So standing there, I mean, it was kind of surreal to think I'd already by that point been working on the mission for nine years. It's a long time. It was my whole career, basically. Um, but I had total confidence that it was gonna, everything was going to go very smoothly. So it was a very joyful experience. All right, and I think we have one more question from our online audience. Can the spectral absorption lines from a planet tell us what the planet is like? Uh, can tell us if the planet has life. Ah. Yeah, that's a great question. That's the ultimate objective. You know, as I said, that light passing, either bouncing off of the surface or passing through an atmosphere, carries with it this chemical fingerprint. Um, and what we want to do, one of the pathways for finding evidence of life beyond the solar system is to look for worlds where life has taken a global hold on the planet. It's really transformed it into a living world by creating a global biosphere. And what that means is that all the metabolic byproducts of life are, are influencing the atmosphere in a, in a very um, significant way. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the chemical fingerprints of, of atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, we should be able to, we hope, that we'll be able to tell if a world is a living world or a, or a lifeless world. Um, that's exactly the objective and what we will be doing on the kind of the 30-year horizon. Yeah, and that, that's one of the most fundamental questions, I suppose. Yes. It's something that humans have always wondered and pursued. Yeah. Are we alone? And that's... Absolutely. It's an incredible thing to be, to be pursuing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'd like to close, I guess, with you know, you, you've had this amazing life. We don't have too much time, but just what, what advice do you have for someone who wants to go into a career like what you have? I, um, you know, I, this morning I read a book to children upstairs. It was a, a wonderful book, but it gave the impression right out the gate that in order to be a scientist or an engineer, you had to demonstrate some kind of genius at a very early age. And I think that that's a huge fallacy. I think that uh, science is definitely hard, but it's, it's something that anybody can do. And what distinguishes yes. somebody like me from somebody who doesn't do science or, but yet maybe wanted to is just persistence. Yeah. I was really Absolutely. bad at physics when I first started it. I'm so sorry. We have yeah. To end there. Um, but, but I persisted. So I think Absolutely. that's the most important thing. Persistence. We have to end it there, Natalie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank I also want to thank me. our sponsor, Boeing, for this program. Thank you all for watching.